Okay, so I hope the screen is visible. Is it visible? The screen is, you can see. Yes, ma'am. All right. So, yeah, what we were doing yesterday was this new topic called base nets, also referred to as graphical models. Um, and in particular, uh, we started looking at these directed graphical models. Okay, so, um, you know, there's this whole <clears throat> big fat textbook on graphical models by Daphne Koller. Uh, so, I mean, that's the kind of importance this kind of a topic has in machine learning. I mean, it's a very well and, you know, extensively studied topic. So what we'll do in this course is just to get you started and introduce you into this topic. Of course, we, we won't be going into every minute detail. Uh, so this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of things we do in AI. Okay. So uh, these base nets or graphical models, it's a way to express the relationships between various random variables. Um, and more specifically, you have a directed acyclic graph uh, where each of the nodes, each of the vertices of the graph uh, correspond to these random variables. And the edges show some kind of a relationship if you know x1 and x2 these nodes are connected if there is some impact between each other or i should say if they directly impact each other okay if it is a very obvious impact that's when you connect them and also we have these uh, conditional probability tables corresponding to each of the nodes um so we were seeing an example of you know simple examples like uh, rain and traffic and I showed you what kind of tables you have, what kind of you know, uh, representations you could have. The key idea why you have base nets, uh, what's the motivation for bringing in base nets is to have a more efficient representation of your joint distribution. So where we stopped last, uh, last class was that, you know, we looked at this case where, you know, if you have five binary random variables, five Bernoulli random variables, uh, then what happens is the joint distribution uh, will have 32 entries, right? Two power five entries. That is about 32 entries in the joint distribution. Now, uh, what the base net helps you do is it tries to simplify or try to bring a reduction in the amount of space in the representation, essentially. So if you have this kind of you know, a disconnected network where each of the nodes are like a standalone uh, nodes and they don't have any connections. In that case, what we saw is, you know, these are all binary valued. So you need two uh, values. So for X1, there are zero and one. And uh, so there are two probabilities so that you can further bring it down to just one probability. Because if you know the probability of X1 equal to one, that that's all you need. So probability of X, one equal to zero is just going to be one minus probability of x1 equal to one. So all you need is you just represent this number, right? So you need just one value. So here also everywhere you just need one value. So this 10, you can you know further bring it down to just five numbers. And uh, any computation, any joint probability that you want to compute, you can compute using you know these uh, take, I mean these numbers that are given to you. Okay. And so that is for this example where, you know, everything, all the, what this means is that all the random variables are modeled as independent of each other. And um, another example is this chain, chain kind of a network, where here what we say is that X2 and X1 have a very clear dependency, X3 and X2 have a dependency and so on. So wherever you have an edge, you know that there is some, uh, there's a possibility of modeling the dependence there. So in this case, we saw that for X1, you need two values. So again, uh, a reduction means you can bring it down to one okay, by the same logic that we had here. And for X2, uh, what you will model here is probability of X2 given X1, right? So there are two random variables which decide uh, the size of the table, so it's four. So here also you can just bring it down to three, right? Because all, the, all of them sum to one. So what you will have is in particular, you'll have probability X2 equal to uh, one, given X1 equal to one, that's one value. And uh, you can have probability of X2 equal to, uh, what else? One given X1 equal to zero. 
actually you just need two values right the other two you can get uh, directly so you don't even need three values right uh, is this clear you know you can greatly reduce this numbers right so uh, what you can get is probability of x2 equal to 0 given x1 equal to 1 since these are conditional probabilities so probability of x2 equal to 0 has to be 1 minus probability x2 equal to 1 given x1 equal to 1 right so that way you just need two numbers here and again here you just need two two and two right all of them just need two numbers um, i mean if you're talking like of a strict uh, reduce in the i mean if you're looking strictly at you know how many values you need uh, you just need about how much was this this was this nine nine values right and for the joint probability table actually you just need 31 so 32 is the total number of entries but since all of them sum to one you need 31 values so this is a huge reduction that you have between 31 and 9 or 31 and 5 okay so that's what these base nets are trying to give you okay so uh, a reduction in the you know the representation that's what uh, we're trying to utilize right with this base nets okay uh, so were there any questions here uh, from yesterday's class or whatever we just discussed now no questions was this clear? Uh, I don't know if uh, things were clear. Satvik? Is clear? Okay. Yes, ma'am, clear. Okay. So, uh, yeah, great. So, maybe what I'll do is I'll just take one more example uh, that is a popularly studied example in the Russell Novick book and also any base net course, you will see this kind of a example. So that is this network here. Okay, so you can see that I've picked this up from the Berkeley slides. Uh, so here, this is an example where there are five random variables. So this is what a typical base net looks like. You have this uh, network. So very specifically, it's a directed acyclic graph. And uh, you have these tables. So what you have is, so this is actually a network where these random variables uh, denote, I mean, the interpretation is this. So B is a random variable. It says that, you know, there is a burglary in your house. Okay, so you're trying to uh, analyze when there was a burglary or, uh, you know, there's an alarm and, you know, you're trying, you have a burglar alarm fitted in your house and you're trying to diagnose whether a burglary actually happened or not. Okay, so that's this network. So burglary happened. And uh, E was the event that, you know, E was the random variable that there's an earthquake. So whether an earthquake happened or not. So that's the random variable. And A is the fact, I mean, A is the random variable. It says that the alarm sounded. Okay. And J and M. So these are like two random variables. So J is neighbor one. So there's like John. Okay. Uh, so John gave you a call. John called you. And M is that Mary called. So you've gone somewhere outside. So you're traveling and you have this burglar alarm. And uh, so uh, sometimes your neighbors call. And uh, so the reason you want to see whether when somebody called is, did a burglary actually happen or not? And the alarm goes off. I mean, it sounds even when a burglary happens, that's one reason. The other reason is when an earthquake happens. OK, so it's kind of, kind of drastic. Uh, uh, causes, but I mean, this is just to, you know, so that we understand what is going on uh, with the base nets. Okay, so these are, uh, so all of these are binary random variables or Bernoulli random variables. And what you have in the base net, the table is corresponding to B, you just have this table. So you just have probability of B. So plus B is the burglary happened. Okay, so here they've indicated as plus B and minus B, two values. And uh, E is, you know, the probability that an earthquake happens. Okay, so that is this corresponding to this node E, you have this probability table. Now, corresponding to A, what you have is the conditional probability A given B and E. So that is actually this table here. So you have all possible combinations of B, E, and A, and then you have this numbers, okay, corresponding to each configuration. 
And uh, corresponding to J and M, you have this. So probability of J given A and probability of M given A. So you have all possible configurations here within these local, in some sense, these local conditional probability tables. So it's local because it's not, you don't model every other variable in the network as far as this conditional probabilities are concerned. Okay, so this is a typical network. And um, so this is all that you are given, these conditional probabilities. Now, the key thing is you can compute any joint probability using this network and using these tables. Okay, so we saw some example yesterday, so I didn't specifically plug in the numbers and show you. I thought it's useful to see that, okay, if you pick out from the table and see. So now I'm trying to compute this probability. So what this means is what's the probability that B equals plus B, E equals minus E, A equals plus A, j equals minus j and m equals plus m. okay so i'm going to compute this using these tables okay so uh, what i would do is you know i'll start off with picking the value of b first i mean i'll go step by step from this network and uh, i will follow the structure of the network to compute these values um, so can you tell me first how would you compute it with chain rule can somebody tell me before we go into the computation with the base net? Can you tell me what it would, what this joint probability would look like if you applied chain rule? P of P equal to plus B into the probability of remaining given P of B equal to plus B, and then we keep doing it for the rest. Yeah, so then can you tell me one more step? So the rest of them given B equal to B. P of A so given B. P of E, um, so e equal to minus E given, I'll just write it as a shorthand, okay, because it's clear from the context. So E equal to minus E given plus B, then what else? P of have? A equal to plus A given B and E. Given B and E, so plus B and minus E. And uh, P of J equal to J given B, E, and A. So this is minus J minus here. So, right, so probability J equal to minus J given plus B minus, minus e, and e and plus A. Plus A. And one more. Right? P of M equal to plus M given plus B minus E plus minus J. Right. So, right, so this is how you would... Uh, compute, you know, if you just apply the chain rule, okay, and of course, this is not unique, you can split it in whatever way you want, but you would need all these, uh, you know, different sets of conditional probabilities, and probably a large conditional probability table to compute this, for example, this one here, it requires, uh, you know, these five entries to be there. Okay, so that is one way. So this is how you would one way to compute it with chain rule. Okay. Now, if we are going to use the base net, what you will do is you will simplify this a little bit. You're making some underlying assumptions. That's where it gets simplified. So can somebody tell me what it would be with the base net? If you used the base net. P of B equal to plus B into so, P of e equal to minus E. Yes. Into P of plus A given plus B and minus E mm -hmm. into P and of minus A given plus A. P of minus J. Minus A given plus A. Plus A, yes. Plus M given plus A. Plus A, right? So, yeah. So this is how you would compute it with the base net. So these two terms are there. But uh, yeah, so the first three terms, you know, you probably use even that in chain rule. But there is some saving here in terms of these two terms. So what this is telling you here is the underlying assumption that's being made here is if you know A, if you know the value of A, the random variable J is independent of B and E. Okay, so that's the underlying assumption that's giving you this. Okay, so what it's telling you is this network is I'm implicitly assuming that probability of you know j so so something like j is conditionally independent of b given a 
So that's an underlying assumption that this is making, this network is making. So that's why you have that these two will ultimately be equal. Okay, and similarly here, M is conditionally independent of B and E given A. So that is a hidden assumption that this network is making. And uh, so actually, if you try to, you know, if you fix a joint distribution and write these representations, and on one side, try to compute the value from the base net, and on the other hand, try to apply the chain rule, you're going to get the same thing. Okay, because the underlying assumptions uh, lead to these two values being the same. Okay, so it's a simplification in some sense. Now, what we want to see more generally is if you have a network like this, like, okay, this is a small network, but typically you have like very complex networks, like what I showed you the other day, like uh, there was this network here, right? So something like this, where you had like several models, I mean, several random variables interacting. And maybe you know some of the values of the random variables. Maybe you're given that an accident happened and you're trying to diagnose what another random variable could have been, right? given some evidence. So what you observe is typically, typically called the evidence. Okay? So that's the kind of question you want to answer. Um, and these base net, more generally, it makes the assumption that you know if you have these random variables x1 to xn, um, this uh, you know xi given you know x1 to x i minus one. So in chain rule, what we would do is you would have uh, you know x1 xn. So probability of you know these values. So let me just write it with small uh, values x1, x2, etc. Up to xn. So what this means is probability that x1 is x1, x2 equal to x2, and so on. So if you rotate with chain rule, you will as you'll just write something like this: x2 given x1, and so on, up to probability xi given x1 to xi minus one, and so on. Okay, so probability of xn given x1 to xn minus one. Okay, you would write the probability like this. So these are small x's. So what this, I mean, I hope this is clear. This notation just means x probability that x1 equal to small x1. Okay. And here this is x1 equal to small x1 and x2 equal to x2. And here what um, you assume in the base net is probability xi given x um, should be a bit more consistent there. Is. So x1 to xi minus 1. This probability. You just replace it with xi given the parents of xi. Okay, so uh, that's what we just did here. The underlying assumption made was conditional independence. Okay, so I'm just writing it a bit more formally. Okay, so the parents of here, the parents of a were b and e, and the parent of j was just a. So if you're trying to compute the probability of j given all the values, all uh, the previous values of the random variables, what you say is that it only depends on its parent. Okay? Um, but typically what happens is if you have a very complicated network, uh, sometimes uh, you know it's not very immediate to say one part of the network is conditionally independent of the other. So we need some kind of a systematic procedure to come up with this. Okay? Uh, right, so let's just get to that part. Now, uh, so what I'm going to do is, you know, there's a specific algorithm here where you want to analyze if one part of the network is independent of the other or not. Okay, so that's called a deseparation algorithm. Okay, and there are some set of rules that you follow. Uh, you try to look at some simple base cases and then you try to see which part of the network is, uh, you know, you try to use these to analyze larger networks. For example, if I take, uh, maybe let's take one example, um, probably something like this. So before we go on to this one, let's just give you a motivation for it. So suppose I have a network like this. This is again um, a standard example. So I'll just tell you what it means. So some network like this. And uh, maybe something like this. 
Okay. So this is something like, you know, it's the rain traffic example. So where R is, you know, the random variable saying that it rains, T is that it uh, there's traffic, and M is a random variable which says that there's a match going on in the city. So there's a some cricket match in the city. Okay. And uh, you know, so the rain, the presence of the rain probably affects that, you know, whether the match is going to happen. And the match, uh, you know, the fact that the match is happening affects the traffic uh, in the city. And L is something like the low pressure in the environment. So that causes rain. And uh, D is maybe something like there is a dripping roof. Okay, So there's a, drip, uh, you know, a roof which is dripping in your neighborhood. Okay. So maybe some network like this, and uh, you probably want to see the you know impact between M and B. You know, does the presence of a cricket match um, affect the you know that the roof drips? So some such relationships you want to analyze. It's not very evident in every network. Okay, so let's try to see what happens for some simple cases. Like we'll consider like uh, you know small graphs with just three nodes, and then we will build further. Okay. So the name given to it is called, the, it's the deseparation algorithm, if you want to look at it from some textbooks. Okay. So uh, what we'll do is let's consider the first case. So there are some three canonical cases here. So there are three cases. So depending on the structure of the network. Okay. So one case is let's take a simple network. You have something like this. Okay, there are three random variables. And uh, this is a chain kind of a structure. Okay, so uh, yeah, can you think of an example where you've seen this kind of a chain structure? It's something you have learned in the past. Uh, does this remind you of something you've seen? Maybe in your probability class. Okay, am I speaking to myself? Am I audible? Ma'am, can you repeat the question also? Yeah, the question is like, I'm taking this case where there is a network like this. It's a kind of chain structure. So what I wanted to ask you is, you know, there are three random variables here. So does this remind you of something that you have seen in any class, any probability? Or so there's a relationship between X and Y. There's a relationship between Y and Z. So you particularly don't see a relationship between X and Z. So perhaps Z is conditionally independent of X if you know Y. Have you seen something remotely similar to this? My Markov decision process yeah, Markov decision process is one. And uh, okay, Markov decision process, you have this actions and all that, right? You have like a decision to be made. So here there's no decision to be made. So it's close, like Markov chains, right? So in Markov chains, you have uh, x1, x2, like that at different time steps. So x1 is uh, the value of the random variable at some time one, at time one. Then you have at time two what happens and time three and so on. Right. And you have that, you know, at any time T, you only if you know what happened at time T minus one. Right. So this is X T minus one. So if you know what happened at time T minus one, then the other random variables, all these don't impact X T. Right. So, uh, right. So that is an example that you have seen. So this is actually, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's almost identical to that, just that you have three variables here. So this is called a causal chain, okay, because there's a chain structure here. Now here, um, the fact is, if you don't know why, then probably x can impact z, right. Uh, but if you know why, then x and z can be, I mean, they can be conditionally independent of each other, right. So let's take the case that, you know, suppose you know why. So probability that uh, so suppose if you know why so what this means is that why why is an evidence variable so there's evidence of why evidence is why 
okay and uh, so what you're trying to see is you know probability of x equal to some x z equal to some um, small z given y equal to some y okay so when you know y what it means is that the random variable y takes a fixed instantiation as small y okay so if you know this now what we are interested to see is uh, is this probability i mean are x and z conditionally independent if you know y so is this equal to probability x equal to x given y equal to y times probability z equal to z given y equal to y okay so you recall that this is the definition of conditional independence right so this is what you want to verify okay so how would you compute this probability now from the network so all that you can compute given this base net is this joint probability so the base net always allows a way to compute uh, this probability that's all you know how to compute okay so if i tell you that how will you compute the left hand side does anybody want to try so probability x equal to x z equal to z given y equal to y so can you tell me how you would compute this by using the chain by using chain rule uh, how would that be Uh, like mem probability x equal to y given y equal to y into probability that into that given y equal to y. So probability x equal to x given y equal to y. Uh, times multiply. Mm -hmm. Probability that into that given y equal to y. Uh, this you don't know it right. I mean we are trying to check whether this is true. So this is still a question mark. We don't know this, right? I mean, we, we are trying to, you know, say, I and mean, we're trying to check whether this is true, but before that we have to, you know, compute this in the most general possible way, right? Do you understand uh, what's going on here? Ma'am, we will directly apply the normal, means we will exp uh, split the, that uh, conditional case, means P of, uh, we will write that the p of the x is equal to x1, z equal to z, and y equal to y by p of y equal to y. Yes, exactly, right? So if you had this kind of a probability, what you would do is you will compute the joint, z equal to z and y equal to y by probability y equal to y, right? This is how you compute a conditional probability, right? And now what you do is this numerator is a joint probability. And you use the network to evaluate that, right? So this is the network that's given to you. So can you tell me what the numerator is going to be? This joint probability, can you compute it from the network? P of, uh, P of y given x into P of z given y. So P of uh, y, I'll just write it like this, OK? Uh, I hope this is clear. P of y given y x. Given into p of z given y yeah and also x right so there's a probability of x times into x. probability of x yeah okay yeah so this is how you would compute the joint probability okay now uh, from probability y equal to y remember that you do all that you have from this network is probability of x that is there and you have probability of y given x and probability of z given y. Okay, so these are the only three value, three set of tables that you have. And using that, you can compute anything. I mean, whatever you want to compute has to be written in terms of these. Okay, so uh, Sahil mentioned uh, another way, right? I mean, to compute these numbers. I mean, this is what you ultimately want to check. So you will compute two sets of values, one for the left-hand side and one for the right-hand side, and then you will see whether they tally. Okay, and to compute the left hand side, we're using the definition of conditional probability. So the numerator, we have just written it up now. And now how would you compute probability of y equal to y? 
Ma'am, uh, we will join that p of x into p of y by x as the p of x y, and then we are again apply the same key, same thing. So, uh, can you elaborate a little more? So, p of x means you have a table, so there are different values of x. So here, for the denominator, there is no fixed value of x. So, how are you going to do that? You are on track, so I just want you to elaborate a little more. Ma'am. Uh, the product of the p of x into p of y given x is equal to p of x uh, p of x equal to x comma p of y equal to y okay so let me just write it a little separately so what you're saying is probability of x times probability of y given x so yes, what this means is probability x equal to x uh, right and this is i'm just writing this a uh, few times so that people get used to this notations okay uh, okay, so this is what you're saying, and this is probability of uh, y. Is that what you're saying? Uh, P of y equal to y and x comma x. Yeah. So this is a joint between x. Yes, and joint between x and y. x and y, right? Okay. Yes, so now from this, how? I mean, what I want is probability of y equal to y. So how will I get that? So this is as a shorthand. I'll just write this as probability of small x and small y. Uh, but I, I want probability of y equal to y. I don't want an x term in that. So how do I do this? Ma'am, this is equal to the p of y into p of x by y. Okay, so p of y times p of x, x by y. y. X by y. X uh, y. Yes. X okay, y. But, but you see, I don't have these values. What I have in my table is just this. Only these oh. three values, right? So I don't have. I mean, this is what I have to compute. Ma'am, we are trying to, to prove. Ma'am, we are trying okay. to prove that p of x or uh, x and z given y is equal uh, given y is equal to p of x given y into p of z given y, right? The above statement which I have written. We are trying yes. to prove that, right? Yes. So, yes. So, ma'am, if we plug, like if you put these values then in place of that, like uh, p of x into p of y given x. If we substitute that with p of y into p of x given y, and mm -hmm. like similarly for p of z given y, I think then we'll get that. Then we will actually when we put this value in the numerator, the, the in the numerator the p of y and denominator p of y will cancel. Huh? So. No, no, no. So wait, let me address the two things here. So Kushbu, I mean, was it Kushbu who asked or somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Kushbu, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, what you said is, okay, so there is this, um, you said p of x times p of y given x. So that will give you p of x, y. Right? Uh, so now what is saying? Ma'am, like um, in this statement, p of x into p of y given x, that can be written as p of y into p of x given y. Okay, you've got to say it again. <clears throat> um, Mom, that uh, I'll just y, write it so you tell me. I'll write it down. Yeah. Uh, Mom, that p of x comma z given y. P of x comma z given y. Okay. Can be written as p of y into p of y into p of x given y. P of uh, x, x given y. X given y. Okay. X given yeah. y. Yeah. Into P of Z given Y divided by P of Y divided by so P this of Y. P of Y can get cancelled and we'll get what we are trying to prove that P of X comma Z given Y is equal to P of X given Y into Z. Wait, given wait. How did you get this one? Oh, uh, ma'am, from that one? above statement that you have written, P of X into P of Y given X uh, over here. Yeah, this one. Or you're saying this? One? Yes, yes, this one, yeah, this one. Okay, so you're saying okay, so fine. So you instead of writing it as x times y given x, you wrote it as y times x given y divided by p of y, and you yeah. try to uh, cancel things out. Yeah, okay, this is fine. So what I'm trying to deduce at here is, you know, directly from the network structure, if you had to compute these. I mean, here you're using different kinds of probabilities, right? 
like you're trying to use x given y and things like that right uh, you don't have that values so what you are going to have is y given x and you'll have x right and i just want to compute anything i want to compute i only want to make use of these right this is all i'm allowed to use so in that case how would i show i mean what how would i you know come do this computation that's the question i'm trying to get at right what you're saying is like you know you can manipulate things and but how do you know which way you have to go how do you know that this is the route i should take right i mean it's not uh, like you just try out different things so there's a systematic way in which you can try and it will work okay so that's what i'm trying to get at okay so uh, so coming back to you know what rishabh was telling uh, so kushbu is it clear like what i'm trying to hint at yes ma'am right okay uh, yeah so yeah rishabh was telling something it was rishabh right i mean i yes ma'am yeah okay so you were trying to tell me something like how you would compute this So I'm just uh, removing this part, okay? Whatever. Ma'am, it's almost the same means. Uh, okay, the same thing you were trying to get at. Yes, ma'am, but uh, means uh, we are not means we are uh, explaining the same thing which we wrote means. Kuch uh, bhi wrote just uh, ab uh, means he okay. wrote the uh, y uh, yes ma'am p of y into p of x u n y i wrote okay. uh, means i explaining on the basis of this. Okay, 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 fine. So you, I hope you understand what uh, the issue is, right? I mean, I'm trying to do something just using these tables, using what I know from the network. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So yeah. So tell me, how would I compute probability y equal to y, uh, just using these values? I mean, you're almost there. So it's just a slight difference from what you do, what you told here. So I need probability y equal to y, and I can use x probability of x. I can use probability y given x, or I can write this joint probability, and I can do uh, some manipulations with the joint. So see the issue with this. I mean, if if I write this, I mean I will have this expression probability of x equal to x and y equal to y. So I will need to do a summation over all these x's, right? Right. So probability y equal to y. If I have to compute, what would I do? I will need to, you know, sum up over all possible values of x and perhaps all possible values of z. So let's just write it in terms of the joint itself. Okay. So probability of x, y, and z. So this is a fixed value. Y is a fixed quantity, and x and z is what I'm going to sum up over. So now this joint, I can write it using the network, right? So it's just what somebody said. Uh, you know, you can just write it as uh, probability of x times probability y given x times probability of z given y. Right? These are things that the network gives me, and I can write this. Now, uh, is there something you can simplify here? There are these two summations. Anything sums to one, or any summation you can move in, or something like that. Okay, I wonder if people are lost now. Uh, and others we could move the p of x out sir p of and x yeah sigma over all x okay so okay so you're saying like uh, or move the z inside so let me just write it so p you're saying something like this yeah i'm not sure like if it simplifies it's fine i mean it's fine like yeah And maybe the z you move it in, right? Because there's no dependency on z between all of them, right? So we can do something like this, right? And what is this value? One. This one. is one, right? So what you are left with is, yeah, it's exactly summation over x, probability of x, probability of y given x, right? And 
what happened now. Uh, so this is a different value of x dash, right? So let me, and, okay, so this is x. So I'm just trying to plug it in here. So this will give me uh, probability of x times probability of y given x. Okay, so this was some value of x dash. Okay, I just don't want to confuse this x and the x here. So I'll just write this as x dash. Okay, so what happens now? Okay, so I just realized that, okay, we didn't have to do all of this. There's an easier way to simplify this. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can just, so, okay, if you had to compute probability of y equal to y, you would just compute it in this way, in the summation. But what is going to happen is this whole value here, does it simplify to something? Does anything simplify here? Do you recognize anything going on here? P of x given y. Yeah, this is just P of x given y, right? It's just base rule. Okay. So yeah, I think I probably caused some confusion in your minds. So what I just did is, okay, so this part was just P of y, right? I mean, okay, we didn't have to do all this, but I just wanted to you know, write everything in terms of what we know from the network. Okay, so yeah, basically these uh, two values and this p of y equal to y. If you you recognize that you know you can apply base rule here, and you're going to get p of x given y, right? And uh, so that's just this, right? So the right hand side now, what you're going to get is just probability x given y times probability of z given y. And that gives you this right hand side. Okay, so okay, so a lot of uh, things going back and forth here. So what we just showed here is that you know if you know the value of y, x and z are conditionally independent. Okay, that this was just to show that you know for this network, this is what is going to happen. Okay, uh, yeah. So can I just pause for a minute and ask you if, if there are any questions? I know there's a lot of back and forth, so the best way to resolve this, if you ask if, uh, any confusions that you have, if you ask, then things get resolved. So, is this is this okay, or is anything bothering you, or? Okay, Tanuja. Yeah, Tanuja, uh, you said something oh, I, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, yeah, I said it's clear. It's clear? Okay. Uh, okay. What about Jayashika? It's clear, ma'am. It's clear? Okay. Fine. So, uh, yeah, in these kind of networks, what you just want to, you know, when you want to see if something is conditionally independent, you try to prove this. Or there's another way to show this, right? I mean, there's another uh, equality for conditional independence. Do you remember that? We saw two ways to show something is conditionally independent. Um, do you remember the other definition? So this is one way, and we showed that this is true. What is the other way to check for conditional independence? Nobody remembers? Something like this, probability x equal to x given y equal to y and z equal to z. What can you say about this? Is equal to p of x equal to x given y equal to y. Yeah. Right? So other ways to show whether this is true. Okay, so what I will, uh, maybe, yeah, I think you, uh, if you want, we can do this once in class, given that's the first time we are trying it. So this is one way where, you know, we showed this uh, inequality. So let's try to write the other one. So we have about two, three minutes. So I'll try to do this. Um, 
so the other way all so this is an alternate way okay so probability that uh, x so let me just write this so probability of x given y z this you want to compute and on the other hand you want to check whether this is equal to x given y Right. So you wanted to show that X and Z are conditionally independent given Y. Right. That's what you wanted to show. Okay. So now this one, so probability of X given Y, Z, you can write this as X, Y, Z given probability of Y, Z. Right. Just using first principles and uh, the joint again, you can always use the network. And you write it as x given y, y given x, and probability of z given y, because of the chain structure. And here again, you have probability of y z. Okay. So, what can you do further? Anything strikes? Any thoughts on how to do this? We can substitute for T of YZ. Yeah, so you can just look at this part of the network and maybe you can just write probability Y times probability Z given Y. Right? And then you what, it, what you're going to get is these two terms cancel out. And you're left with probability x, probability of y given x by probability of y. And this is just from base root, this is just probability of x given y. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, so uh, you can also try to, you know, write this in terms of the joint distribution alone uh, using the network. And finally, you will get back this term itself. Okay. So, yeah, so, so you see that there are two ways to show something like this, that you have uh, conditional independence between X and Z given Y. So this is one uh, case, one kind of a network structure. Um, and if you didn't know anything, suppose you don't know Y, then what can you say? Can you say that X and Z are dependent or are they independent? What, what do you think? Suppose I didn't give you Y. So one case we saw was if you know why X and Z are independent, given Y. So suppose you don't know uh, Y. So all you are trying to see is, if, okay, so let me just write it. If you don't know Y, so you don't have this evidence now. So if you don't know Y, so what can you say? Are X and Z independent? Right. So in this case, what you have to show is you, I mean, if you want to check something, you have to see if this is equal to probability of X times probability of Z. Right. That's what is independence. Okay. So either you have to try to see that, you know, this, you, you try to prove that this is true. Or if you're not able to prove it, uh, perhaps they are not uh, independent. And uh, then you can try to construct an example where you know x and z are dependent okay so that's a way to show that you know x and z are not independent okay so actually in this example it turns out that you know x and z if you don't know why there is a dependence between x and z okay so that you can construct by just taking that you know all these random variables are equal right so y is equal to x I and mean, whatever value you have for x y takes the same value with probability 1 and whatever you have for y, z takes the same value with probability 1. So if you have something like that, then they are dependent, right? This models the dependence in that way. Okay, but if you know y, then, you know, x and z are independent. Okay, so uh, we will, again, I'll summarize this case tomorrow when we begin. And then there are two other cases as well. Uh, so these three cases are together going to help to analyze larger networks. Okay, so I'll stop here for today and maybe if there are questions, I'll just hand back. Okay, um, if not, uh, thanks everyone.